will set a standard that I think will be talked about for years afterwards. What I'm going to do in the next 15 or 20 minutes or so is talk a little bit about the work my lab has been doing on the modulation of cellular senescence. And rather than go through the usual slides, I'll just refresh the paradigm for everybody. All right? As I think most people in this room know, this is how we think senescence contributes to aging. The normal course of your life, you lose cells. That loss is balanced by cell division. Cell division is monitored as an anti-cancer mechanism. And after sustained replication, exit from the cell cycle is signaled, or it can be induced by a series of different sort of one-hit stimuli. This results in an altered phenotype. And although senescent cells are produced as part of normal physiological processes and have some beneficial effects, they're intended to be cleared by the immune system. If immune clearance fails, which it does during later life, when senescent cells are actually being made in increasing numbers, they start to accumulate and disrupt the physiology of any tissue in which they accumulate. There are multiple lines of evidence that show that this is a highly plausible mammalian aging mechanism. I'll just put one up, the two most famous dead mice in the history of aging research, I think. And as we know from the work of Jim Kirkland, Jan van Dusen, Darren Baker and others, if you remove senescent cells in transgenic mouse models, you improve many aspects of health. My favorite improvement is very simple. It's wheel running. These animals run further and they run for longer when they've had their senescent cells removed. And if you scale that up into people, which I did with colleagues from the sports science department, it's the difference between being able to continue to live independently in your own home or having to give that home up having to potentially move into sheltered accommodation and feel the boundaries of your world contract around you. And as we know, multiple senolytic trials are now in progress, and the great hope of that area is to move from the slide on my left to the one on my right and get those things into people and working. And so we all know that there are many senolytics that kill senescent cells. I work on something slightly tangential, which is the reversal of senescence. And I look at situations in which it's possible, desirable, and I'll present one situation today where I think very strongly that it will prove to be essential. And as a tool to help us with this, we work for, we work for a number of years with a molecule called resveratrol. And again, this will not be a stranger to many people in this room. In a typography of geroprotectors evolved by a remarkably talented chemist, Richard Hartley at Glasgow, resveratrol is what he refers to as a type two network engaging drug. That is a compound which interacts with multiple biochemical networks, each of them relatively weakly. And as I've done here, you can comb through the literature, you can find multiple examples as resveratrol doing different things. If you use fairly standard bioinformatics like Metacor, you can see that those effects are almost certainly mediated by highly distinct pathways. So a drug that does everything not very well, how can we sort the wheat from the chaff? How can we unpack the functions that are important? And the way in which we've chosen to do this was inspired by my collaborator, Professor Lizzie Osler, who, as many of you will know, is also Mrs. Richard Farragher, because I'm one of those old-fashioned scientists who believe that plagiarism begins at home. And so what we've in fact done, or what Lizzie has done, is developed a simple one-pot synthetic route for these compounds. She's made over 40 of them. They drop straight out. Most of them are completely novel. The yields are excellent, so it's very suitable for library approaches. And with a set of structural homologues, you can do some quite interesting things. You get series of compounds with controlled network interactions. This is just some of the data. If you're interested, I would direct you to the paper. The top graph is 
activity against one of resveratrol's canonical targets, so two in one. And as you can see, the compounds vary from being a little bit better than resveratrol to, being, to doing nothing, to being very much worse, and in fact more potent inhibitors than certanol with actually lower toxicity. And what we did once we had the library was we looked to see what these resveralogs would do to senescent cells. And the reason we did this was because I was approached by a very talented lady, Professor Lorna Harries, who's in the bottom right-hand corner on that slide, is at the University of, es of Exeter and is now CEO of a company called Sinisca. Lorna was interested, and still is, in RNA splicing and knew these compounds affected splicing factors. And so what we did was we supplied a few of our compounds to Lorna deliberately picking ones that had no activity against CERT1, ones that had variable activities against CERT1, and ones that had variable effects on the SASP, ranging from quite good inhibition to leaving some up and standing. And this is important for the next part of the story, because what we wanted to do was make sure we could exclude paracrine suppression effects from senescent cells in the culture. And with the five compounds we selected, we found something quite impressive, that resver resverologs will rescue senescence and allow renewed proliferation. So at the appropriate dose, senescent cells will re-enter the cell cycle, they will begin to divide again. This is associated with an extension of telomeres, and they will continue to proliferate. If you take the compound away, the telomeres shorten back down, and they go back to sleep. So that was, I'd love to say that was an expected finding, but it wasn't. But it was good that it happened. We knew they would do something. And so we have our hands on a panel of compounds that can reverse replicative senescence. Are they of use against other types of senescence? And the model that we decided to use was a type of therapy-induced senescence in equids. There are several reasons for this. One is that I'm very good friends with Roger Smith, who's the gentle in whose lab this took place. The other one is that tendinopathy is common with aging. It causes severe morbidity in people. It also causes severe morbidity in performance horses, which means that treating tendinopathy is a commercially extremely sensitive area because there is that old, old bon mot of how do you become a millionaire and you start off as a billionaire and get into racehorses. Okay, and so we looked at the superficial digital flexor tendon, the FDFT, in these animals because it's the human Achilles. Both of those injuries are often treated with corticosteroids and this often does more harm than good because they suppress the inflammation, but they also induce a senescent state. And if you do it repeatedly, the tendon gets worse, not better. And if the, these are data from equine tenocytes, I hope what you can see, using doses that are significantly below the doses you get in vivo, Corticosteroids will senesce tenocytes. That senescence is associated with an upregulation of the standard CDKIs, a restricted SASP that we term the ESASP, and the upregulation of a range of MMPs that will degrade the tendon. This is not good news in a tendon. The good news part of this story is that we are able to prevent therapy-induced senescence by corticosteroids using compounds from our resveralog library in a way that is CERT1 independent, like the reversion effects at all. Because V29, a compound in our library, does not interact with CERT1 at all. It doesn't activate it. And so this hopefully would mean that we can improve outcomes where corticosteroids are used in tendon injury. We're not the only people to be using these compounds. A colleague, Michael Wormstone, until very recently at the University of East Anglia, is using the parent compound to treat posterior capsule opacification. We're expecting to be able to dig into that and find out which pathways are involved, whether they are the same or different in the PCO situation. And the reason that we can do this is, again, because we have a compound library. 
Um, the screening system to pull out the pathways is very, very straightforward. We're doing that at the moment. We'll probably have it completed within a few months. And those results are not ready for prime time, as they say. And so I hope I've shown you that there are a couple of occasions where this might be desirable as well as simply possible. I'm going to now show you one where I think reversing or protecting from senescence is going to be essential. And this is in a slightly odd area for this community, which is the field of bioartificial organs, especially bioartificial liver systems. There's a schematic of a bioartificial liver behind me, and I'll show you a picture of the real device in a moment. But all one needs to know is that the core of these systems are hollow fiber cartridges containing Hep G2 cells. All right. There's about 800 grams to a kilogram of Hep G2s in the cartridges. And if you have liver failure, as you probably know, ammonia levels in your blood will go up, albumin levels will go down. The idea for a long time has been to plug sufferers into one of these devices. Their blood flows through the hollow fibers. Ammonia diffuses into the Hep G2 cells, which turn it into urea and secrete it back and they secrete Albion as well. They do other things like detoxify antibiotics. There's a surprisingly large need for these systems, mostly driven by the shortage of organs. As many of you may be aware, aging is a major risk factor for the development of liver disease, but it's a bit of a one-two punch because as the population ages, we will start to see some problems. Increasing age is an independent predictor of poor transplant outcomes, whether you're giving an organ or getting one. And so we might end up with a situation where you have more people needing organs, they're poor transplant um, recipients, and the organs they get might not be very good. So anything that can be done would be useful. Um, but people have been working on these bowels for some time, and they always fail. This is just a study from pigs. Something about the patient's plasma causes the cells in the device to stop working properly. And people have persevered in the way that people do and cut their trial data and cut their trial data. These things have gone as far as um, phase three where they failed epically. And that's simply to show you what one of the devices look like. The Culprits are almost certainly a potent cocktail of endogenous hepatotoxins. So I'm talking about things like ammonia, bilirubin, bile salts. And I was reading through this literature for reasons that don't matter. And people were describing the phenotypes of the cells after exposure to patient plasma. And they were eerily reminiscent, at least to me, of cell senescence, which these guys had never heard of. And with the help of an enormously talented, first of all, PhD student, now I'm glad to say returning as a postdoc, Dr. Neda Hadari, we started to look at this in two and 3D culture systems. And within, within six hours, in fact, it's more like an hour or two hours, exposure to a standard toxin cocktail in plasma will senesce Hep G2 cells. And you can block that with resveralogs. When Hep G2 cells are rendered senescent, they do develop a SAS, but that doesn't matter because you're not hooked up to the patient for long enough. What they do stop doing extraordinarily rapidly is making urea. We can block that with resveralogs. And what they also do is they stop making albumin and we can prevent that as well. And I think what we may be looking at here, if you read around in the bioartificial organs area, because people have been interested in making bioartificial kidneys as well, we may be looking at one of the blocks in the road, and we may be looking at the first attempt to bypass it. And that would be good news for the artificial organs field. If you're interested in some of these areas, there's a little book chapter that we wrote, which I would recommend to anybody. And so, just to conclude, what I thought, I hope I've shown you with a quick whistle-stop tour through the data, is that reversal of senescence, not really senolysis, is possible in a variety of potential contexts. 
that this toxin-induced senescence that we've seen in the liver systems may be an under-recognized problem that has hampered the development of bioartificial organs. Much of the focus in the past has been on the bioengineering because that is not a minor challenge, but that's been to the detriment of the cells in the system. If this is the case, and we're pretty sure it is, we're hoping to go to a clinical trial in a couple of years, reversal of senescence is probably the only route you'll maintain organ function in those ex vivo systems. I hope I've also shown you that the creation of a compound series is one route to unpicking the key activities of these type 2 drugs. And you'll have seen kind of walk-on performances by vets, by bioengineers, synthetic chemists, and cell biologists. And I think this shows the need for cross-disciplinary work in our field. And my last slide is not actually to do with my talk, it's to do with the things that I tend to do as my kind of side job. I am the UK's chief cat herder, by which I mean I am the coordinator of 11 networks of scientists and clinicians all focused on different aspects of aging. We are very keen to collaborate with colleagues throughout the world. If there is an aspect of aging you are interested in, I'm sure one of these networks has somebody for you to work with. Please don't be shy and get in touch. We would like nothing better than to work with you. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, we have time for some questions. Morton. Uh, really nice talk, Richard. Um, I was wondering if the, if the senescence reversal, is that, um, does that depend on the drug being there? So when you remove the drugs, do the cells then yeah. revert? Yeah, what to happens, the, our, our working model and, uh, for how you're getting the reversal effect is quite interesting. And it's just basically conversant with the fact I would not die in a ditch over this one, all right? It looks as if the compounds do reverse do reset splicing factor patterns. Some of the splicing factors have non-canonical functions. For example, one opens up the telomere, the other is a transcription factor for H-tert. So I suspect the rescue effect is at least partially dependent on that in that context. However, they're obviously also rescuing senescence that is induced by other stimuli, because in six hours, there's no way, it, that's not telomere driven. So part of the re, invite me back next year if you're having a free cocktail bar and I'll tell you what the pathways are. <laughs> there's a question in the back. Hey Richard, great job. I just wanted to ask you, is it really desirable to reverse something like replicative senescence? I mean, are these cells full of DNA damage and would we end up with Well, cancer? this is the, um, you know, the, the, is, it, is it always going, we, we discuss this a lot, is it always going to be desirable to reverse senescence? Hell no. The bioartificial liver system, that's the only way you're going to get the device working. There are also, for example, situations where <clears throat> clearance isn't a good idea. I'm thinking specifically of the corneal endothelium, which I also work on. So I don't know if colleagues are aware, but your corneal clarity is maintained by a highly specialized set of cells at the back of your cornea, the endothelium. It's tight junctioned, and the aqueous humor has virtually no growth factors in it. So in you, um, cell loss in the endothelial layer is filled overwhelmingly by enlargement of the cells. You do see, if you look with SA beta gal or the other markers through age, you see a large number of senescent cells building up. If you applied a senolytic in that context, I would be worried because you would then end up with an endothelial layer that is filled with holes. You would get corneal decompensation and you'd probably need a graft. So that would be, that would be a thing where I, you know, if somebody said, would you like senolytic eye drops? I'd say, no, you try it on yourself first. Okay. So, yeah, but it is a very real concern, Joel. Yeah. Okay. Thanks again, Thank Richard. Thank you. And